Doctrinal distinction number one had to do with how God speaks to us, and he speaks to us through his word. Now, the nature of his word is what I want to talk about tonight in distinction number two. And it is really important if we say that God speaks to us in his word, and if you miss that, go back and listen to the, to the recording on that one. But if, if we hear God through his word or God speaks to us through his word, then we have to ask the question, well, what is the nature then of his word? And that's what I want to speak about. And uh, for me, and I hope for you, what uh, I believe in is what is called verbal plenary inspiration. Now, some of you are probably thinking, well, that's Greek to me. I have no clue what verbal plenary inspiration is. You've no doubt heard the words verbal and plenary, maybe not used together. And uh, so let's understand what these mean for just a moment. It's really very simple. Verbal means that God gave us words, and that is so key. I, I know that it sounds very basic, and you think, well, of course he gave us words. It is, after all, the word of God, and I open it up, and, and the Bible is full of words, one word after another, and uh, 66 books full of words. Of course it's words. That's simple. Everybody knows that. But everybody doesn't hold to that, and you'll see what I mean here in just a moment. I know you read words, but some people don't believe that God gave us words. So verbal is God gave us words. Plenary, that is, each word is inspired. I know that plenary is not a word that we use very often, but uh, every now and then you'll use it, especially if you go to a convention. And at a convention, from time to time, they will have what is called a plenary session. Now, you know what that is. At the plenary session, everybody comes together. It's the full thing. Now, this is plenary. Every word is inspired by God. Now, the scripture, of course, says all scripture, all graphe, it is inspired by God, and it is profitable for doctrine and correction and teaching and training and righteousness for uh, reproof that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped uh, for every good work. We looked at that passage in 2 Timothy last week. So verbal plenary inspiration, that's the foundation plank that we're going to build tonight. Now, if we believe in verbal plenary inspiration, what's the opposite of verbal plenary inspiration? It's really quite easy to understand. Sometimes people will call it divine inspiration. That is, the scripture is inspired by God. Now, if you just heard tonight, if I were just to tell you, I believe in divine inspiration, you'd probably say, amen, I believe in divine inspiration as well. I want to give you this so that you'll have a little bit of a red flag that goes up. When people start talking about divine inspiration, but don't talk about words. You see, almost nobody will stand before a congregation and say, I just don't really believe that this is of God. Now, you've got to be really liberal to do that. And there are those out there, but not too many of them. And so here as we come along and we, uh, we consider this, there are some who say, boy, this is, the, this is, this is God, God's word, God's mind, God's thought, and it does come from him, and, and it, it, it holds authority. They'll say all sorts of good things about it, but what you need to ask them and what we need to look at is, do you believe in verbal plenary inspiration instead of divine inspiration? Here's what divine inspiration is, that God inspired thoughts and ideas which the biblical authors then put into words. Now think about that for just a moment and the, 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 the significance of that. The significance is the words don't matter so much. What you need to do is come up with the thought or the idea. But you see, so much doctrine is built not upon the thought, but upon the word. And a word can truly make a great deal of difference. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. So not divine inspiration, but verbal plenary inspiration. Now, someone may be saying, oh, wait a minute, how do we know what the words are? After all, you've got so many versions, don't you? The King James Version, the New International Version, the, the uh, New American Standard Bible, the Revised Standard, the English Standard, the, the Message, Today's Living, uh, the Good News Bible, all these versions that we have. How do we know the words you know, one of the things that the scripture speaks about to the, the, the Jews and the nation of Israel, when it talks about their spiritual advantages in Revelation chapter 4, I believe it is, or 3, uh, excuse me, it is chapter 3, 
And Paul says, what advantage is there to the Jew? And, and the scripture says, is, is, the advantage is great. It says, God entrusted to them the oracles of God. The oracles of God are entrusted to them. That is, the word of God. If you take that Old Testament scripture and you, you see the, the, uh, the, the meticulous nature by which a scribe writes down the word of God. You know, it takes them about a year to write just the Torah. That's the five books of the Bible. And so when you come into the Old Testament, there really is very little uh, textual difference. We, we study the Dead Sea Scrolls sometimes, and, and you'll see this. So we, we do nonetheless have to ask, well, from the Old Testament text and the New Testament text, how do we know which one is accurate? One is we honor something called textual criticism. Now, I won't get into this too much. I know it sounds like, oh, I, I don't want to be a critic of the text. And yet there are those in seminaries, and they, their career is to be a textual critic. And that's a good thing for us because they, they search all the texts that are out there, and they work and they determine what text can we trust? Is there anything untrustworthy in the text? And so we honor textual criticism because words matter. Now, there's another way we, we, we know the words and are careful with the words, and that is that you and I, if we believe in verbal plenary inspiration, we're going to use a word-for-word -word translation instead of a dynamic equivalent translation. Now, I typically use the New American Standard. I'll have a comment about that in just a little bit. And that's a word-for-word -word translation. It's a literal translation, you might call it, if you go into the bookstore and they say, well, what kind of translation do you want? Well, I want a literal translation or a word-for-word -word translation. The King James Bible, the New American Standard Bible, the New King James, especially our good word-for-word -word translations. A dynamic equivalent is we got the message across. We got the, uh, the, the gist of the message, and, and uh, we're able to put it through there. So uh, New International Version is a dynamic equivalent, or today's English version, even more of a dynamic equivalent. Now, the question is, can a word make a difference? Don't we just need the idea? No, we need more than the idea. We need the word. And that, I want to give you several examples tonight. And you're going to see how important it is to have a good translation of the Scripture. Now, I want us to look at Luke chapter 13. And if you have your Bible, you might just go ahead and open up to Luke chapter 13 because we'll be looking at several verses. And some of you who are uh, here locally in Katy, you've heard uh, some of this teaching before. But I want us to look at it again, especially for those of you who have not looked at it. Because there is one word that makes a huge difference in what the passage means, and this is the word likewise. And we find it in Luke chapter uh, 13, verse 3. I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Now, likewise means something, doesn't it? And if you believe in verbal plenary inspiration, you, you come together and you say, I have to take every word and I have to see what it is. And you say, well, likewise. It's somewhat of a problematic word because it, it, what it does is it makes that verse not mean what I want it to mean. Here's what I want it to mean. I want it to mean that if you, if you don't turn to Jesus Christ and receive him as Savior and Lord, then you will not experience eternal life in heaven, but rather you'll experience damnation, eternal life in hell. That's what I want it to mean. Now, there is that truth. Let me just say that foundationally, that you need to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. The question is, when I'm preaching it or you're teaching it, is that what the verse actually says or means? So, uh, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Now, likewise is an adverb. And uh, and uh, and that verb modifies the verb, of course, and the verb here is perish. And so uh, the word likewise tells us what? It tells us how you're going to perish. That is, it's a comparative. Now, look at it. I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will perish in this manner, likewise. Now, obviously, if it's a comparative, it's got to compare to something. Look in, in, in Luke chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. It says, on the same 
same occasion, there were some present who reported to him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And Jesus said to them, Do you suppose these uh, Galileans were greater sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this fate? And then we come to verse 3. No, and unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. How did they perish? Well, they perished at the hands of the government. You'll likewise perish. And then he uh, gives in, in verse 4 a message about a tower that fell, and 18 people died. And he says it again in verse 5, unless you repent, you will likewise perish. How? Under a stone. You're going to die at the hands of the government or under a stone. That's, that's what verbal plenary inspiration does now. Follow us along here. And look what the New International Version does. It says, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. One word that they've done differently. Now, there is in Greek a word for too or also. This is not the word. This is the comparative adverb. So it has to describe the manner of perishing. And yet, uh, New International Version said, well, the words aren't important. It's the ideas. Let's just get the idea across. And uh, the idea is they need to repent. Okay, that, that's good. So unless you repent, they say, you too will all perish. Now, too does not tell how you're going to perish, does it? And it doesn't tell uh, who is going to perish because that really has already been clearly expressed. Now, look at it here. Uh, unless uh, I tell, notice what he says, you. I tell you, unless you repent, you will all perish. In fact, I said it's clearly expressed twice, but really it's expressed there three times. I tell you, unless you repent, you will also perish. So there's no need for the word to. It's already in there. We don't need you also. We know it's you, you, you. But New International Version didn't want to put the word likewise because that was uncomfortable for them for perhaps some theological reasons. The New Living Translation goes even farther than this, and it says, not at all, you will perish too. That's what they do with this word. You will perish too unless you repent of your sins and turn to God. I want you to notice, compare on the top, the New American Standard Bible, to the bottom, the New Living Translation. New American Standard uses a word for word and has likewise. But the, the dynamic equivalent say, you also, not likewise. Forget how you're going to die. They say, oh, we don't know how you're going to die. But Jesus is telling something specific, and you miss the heart of the passage here. You miss the warning that is being given if you, you, you don't have to watch this. So you will... Uh, you, you, you will uh, uh, look at this. Excuse me, I'm reading uh, here. Uh, you will all perish unless you turn from your evil ways and turn to God. The New Living Translation. Okay, uh, we may have, uh, Jonathan, thank you for sharing that. Uh, uh, have, uh, th there are several versions out of the New Living Translation. I may have an older one here. So uh, if, if you repent of your sins and turn to God, or you turn from your evil ways to God. Now, again, there's a theological truth to that, isn't there? Yes. And we can find a scripture that teaches that. But those words are not in Luke, uh, Luke uh, 13, verse 3. You're, turn from your sins or turn from your evil ways and turn to God. It's not there. That's not what Jesus said on that occasion. Now, a word makes a difference. Now, I want to, uh, to show you here how, as uh, we look at things, how most translators take this. And uh, here's some words from D Dr. Daryl Bach. Now, he's a conservative. He's not a liberal. Uh, he's not as conservative as I am, nor as I would like him to be. He's from, from uh, Dallas Theological Seminary. And uh, he's what's called a progressive dispensationalist. And he's written a book uh, on that, uh, the, 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 um, the, the magnus opus, I guess it would be, on progressive dispensationalism. Uh, so, but, but here's what he does with it. Notice this. The issue is not when death will happen or why, but avoiding a terminal fate with even greater consequences. Only repentance will prevent a death that lasts. He says, the comparison, homoios, likewise, the comparison is between dying tragically in this life and perishing ultimately before God. 
and without a change of view about Jesus, a black cloud of death hovers over all or over everyone. This tragedy makes evidence of fragile character of life, and Jesus issues a call to repent for disaster looms for the unresponsive. Now, is there a theological truth there? Yes. Is that what Luke 13, 3, and 5 say? No. I want to challenge Dr. Bach on this one. Notice he says right at the beginning, the issue is not when death will happen or why. I agree with him on that. Likewise does not tell when death will happen. Likewise does not tell why death will happen. It tells how death will happen. Now, the is tells a little bit about the why, but it tells how. Likewise means here is how you're going to die if you don't repent. Now, so I agree with him on the, on the, on the very first phrase, but then he goes on to say, but the issue is avoiding a terminal fate with even greater consequences. Now, you can read Luke chapter 13. In fact, read it in context. Get chapter 12, get chapter 13, get chapter 14, read the entire book of Luke if you want, and you will find that Luke 13 is not talking about avoiding uh, a, a death that lasts. It, it's just not. It's not comparing dying tragically with perishing ultimately, or it's not comparing uh, going to heaven or going to hell. This is not an eternal life passage. It's a different passage, and you're going to see what it's about in just a moment. So Dr. Bach says, I don't need the word likewise. He admits it's there in his commentary, Baker Exegetical Commentary, by the way, is a conservative commentary, and he admits the word likewise is there, but he says oh, it, the, the, the comparison is between dying tragically and perishing ultimately. Now, there's a tragic death in verse 2 and a tragic death in verse 5. How he makes that comparison, I don't know. I think he just makes it up. So as we go on, his very next paragraph is this. Art, who's a, who's a scholar, Art asks whether Jesus is referring to the national disaster of A.D. 70. But if so, then Jesus is making the point in an obscure fashion. It's more likely that he's referring to one's general spiritual risk before God. Now, Bach uh, almost comes to the point of saying, let me tell you what the other view is. He <laughs> just hints to it here. And the view is that aren't holes. And that is that Jesus is referring to the national disaster of A.D. 70. That is, he is sitting with some Pharisees in Jerusalem, and he says, do you remember those Galileans that died at the hand of the government? They said, oh, yes, I remember it. It was in all the papers. Sure, I remember it. He says, if you don't repent, you will likewise perish. That is, you'll die at the hand of the government. He says, do you remember in Salome when that tower fell, killed 18 people? Oh, yeah, we were. How could you forget, they say. And he says, unless you repent, you're going to die the same way. <laughs> Those are powerful words. And I think when you take it together, it is a warning, an ominous warning. And we'll see it here as we uh, pull the context in and, the, and, and, and display how important verbal plenary inspiration is. Now, Bach says it is more likely that Jesus is referring to one's general spiritual risk before God. I would say, Dr. Bach, where in the text do we see any kind of evidence at all that makes one's general spiritual risk more likely the, 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 the point of the matter here? And why not just go with the words, likewise? It means in the same way, this is how you are going to die. So let's, uh, let's look at the text and see if there is any evidence that makes this more likely. I think when you look at the text, actually what you see is some clues that he is warning about the destruction of Jerusalem by the government and their looming death that would happen in the year A.D. 70. Here's some clues. First of all, Luke chapter 13, verse 1 says, Now on the same occasion, on the same occasion, someone who believes in verbal plenary inspiration picks up on, on words like that and says, wait a minute, this sets the setting so I can understand. On the same occasion, of course, when you see that then, you say, well, I wonder what that occasion was. And then, of course, you'd work your way back. We don't have time to look through it. Uh, it it's just one word at a time. But if you jump back to Luke chapter 12, verse 47, Jesus has given a parable. The disciples were asking a question about that parable. And the summary is in verse 47. It says, that slave who knew his master's will and did, did not get ready 
or act in accord with his will will receive many lashes. Did you catch that? Jesus is warning about the coming of the Messiah, that the Father is going to send. And, and he's saying, look, you guys aren't ready. And you're going to be like that slave, and you will, there's a punishment that will come. This is the same occasion. He's saying you'll likewise perish. In verses 49, 50, 51, and 52, Jesus says, uh, you know, uh, i I tell you why I, I, I have come. It wasn't to grant peace on the earth, but rather it was to cause division. Listen now. Well, you know, you know, the rejection of Jesus really was the ultimate reason for the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Jesus came and caused division. This was the occasion that he was talking about. On this same occasion was the one he said, I'm going to bring division. 54, 55, and 56 of, of chapter 12. And Jesus says, look, you know the weather. You see a cloud in the west, you say, a storm's coming. And, and uh, you have a south wind, well, it's going to be hot today. And he says, notice in verse 56, he says, you hypocrites, do you know how to analyze the appearance of the earth and sky, but you don't know how to analyze this present time? Isn't that important? This is the occasion when he says, you don't know the times. The Messiah is being sent. You're not ready. You're going to receive a warning. Don't you know the times? The context then goes on in verses 57, 58, 59 in which Jesus uh, speaks about going to see a judge, and he says, you're on the way, and you begin to think, you know, there's a possibility I could lose big time, but I could sit right now and take care of this thing, and all the risk would be done. And on that occasion, he says, let me tell you about these people who died. And if you don't repent, when? Now, right now, on the way to the judgment, on the way to the court, get it done right, and get it done right now, because these times are coming, the time before the judge is coming. If you don't repent, you will all likewise perish. Does this make sense to you? I hope it does, because as you, as you come here, you say, boy, one little word really does make a difference, doesn't it? As, uh, we, uh, when, I, when I go to Israel, here's one of the spots that I like to see. And some of you have been there, perhaps have uh, seen this. This is uh, right uh, just, just south of the Western Wall. And uh, it, 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 these are Herodian stones that uh, were from the, from the temple complex. And these stones were cast down in the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. Now, when you go there, your guide will say, here's pure evidence that Rome destroyed Jerusalem in the year A.D. 70. And when it was, uh, it's laid there for 2,000 years now. And that's exactly what it is. It is that evidence. But when I see these stones, I think Luke 13, 1 through 5, where Jesus says, do you remember a tower that fell and 18 people were killed? Yeah, I remember and he looks them in the eye, and he says, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. The very same way. These stones, Jesus was giving a warning about these stones. I tell you, I always want to go digging through these stones because I'm convinced that if I dug and I looked, I could find the skeleton of the fellow that Jesus was talking to. And I would say, you didn't listen to him, did you? You didn't repent. You didn't accept Jesus as Messiah. And what happened? You ended up perishing. You all likewise perished. Now, this is the difference that a word makes. As we uh, continue on, let me, uh, let's just look at a, a couple of passages here. Like uh, Romans chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, it says, For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. We'll see these colors in a moment. I hope you can see them okay on the screen. For their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural, and in the same way also men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another, men with men, committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. Romans 1 26 and 27. That's New American Standard. Now let's look at it in the message, which is a, a paraphrase, a very loose paraphrase. It says the words don't matter, just the idea. Here's how they translate it. Worse followed, refusing to know God. Now, 
follow the red to the red. The, the, the words literally say, God gave them over. But the translators of the message said, refusing to know God. Let me ask you, if you were to read the message, would you have any idea whatsoever, even a clue, that God had given them over? He had cast them off. He had turned his back on, on, on them. You wouldn't have a clue. And the reason you wouldn't have a clue is because they didn't give you those words. They gave you some kind of idea that there was some issue with God, but they didn't give you the words. And that affects your understanding of God. I suppose the message written in kind of a, a therapeutic hermeneutic that uh, is just, you know, God is love and he's mercy and he's wonderful. And then they're coming along and say, well, we can't write that. We can't say God gave them over because we've got a picture of God where he's loving and he's merciful and he's always patient. He never changes his, his love. He's always just there patiently waiting for them to come back. And look, then this is God gave them over. The idea must be, well, they refuse to know God. Now, did they refuse to know God? Yes, they did. But that's not what these words say. So notice uh, the New American Standard goes on to say, God gave them over to degrading passions. And the message says, that's, that's not politically correct. Let's just say they didn't know how to be human either. Uh, that, the, the words aren't even anything close to that, are they? Now, notice uh, as, you, uh, as you continue on, notice the purple there. The degrading passions were unnatural. In fact, when you read the Greek in here, even the New American Standard does not uh, 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 equate it to, to, the, uh, to the degree that the, the Greek is. It's, a, it, it's a, a, an utterly clear word, so clear that you couldn't read it in, uh, in, a, in a church service, honestly, uh, the, the, the description. But he uses the English word unnatural. Now notice what the message does. They're confused sexually confused. I want to ask you, is there a big difference between unnatural and confused? There is. The words matter. Down later it says, men can, with men committing indecent acts. These are the words God gave to us. What does the message do with indecent acts? They say, well, all lust and no love. Now, it, it, to, to read the message about homosexuality, it looks to me like the, the authors of the message are saying, you know, you, you, you really need to love God and you need to come and it'll help, it'll help you not be confused. And, you know, as long as everyone's in a loving relationship, that's what matters. And if you'll get in a loving relationship with God, then you'll be in a loving relationship with others and you won't be confused. And, and whatever kind of relationship we're in, we're not even going to talk about the, whether it's homosexual or, or it, we certainly wouldn't say it's unnatural or it's indecent, but there'll be love there. You see, they changed the words. They didn't give us the words. Let's look at another uh, passage of Scripture. And again, if you have your Bible, you might want to open to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, because here we have uh, a, a, a section of Scripture that really is very confusing, and it may clear up a couple of things that tonight. It's the passage of Scripture that talks about uh, women and their heads covered. That's a great thing to talk about here as we record this on Valentine's Day, isn't it? Uh, women and their heads covered, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now, Paul gives some very clear instruction, which I think we're very confused about precisely because our translations have not used a a verbal plenary inspiration. I want to, uh, to, to bring to you here uh, some uh, scripture, and uh, let me get this up here so that you can see it. Uh, okay, I believe you can see my uh, Bible software now, and uh, let's look at First uh, Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. And uh, pardon my color coding, that's uh, there for my purposes, to help me know the parts of speech, because I believe in verbal plenary inspiration. That matters. Uh, whether it's a verb or an adverb or an adjective. So uh, Paul uh, says, be imitators of me. I praise you, remember you. But uh, down in the beginning of verse 3, it gets into the heart of the matter for what we need to look at tonight. When he says, I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of every woman, and God is the head of Christ. Now, I believe that verse is the key to understanding all the rest of this. Uh, it, it really is code right there. Christ is the head of every man. The man is the head of every woman. God is the head of Christ. So then he goes to verse 4. 
every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying disgraces his head. You know what, uh, what, what you and I immediately do with that? We totally ignore verse 3, and we go straight to verse 4, and we, uh, we, we say that uh, here we've got this issue in which uh, you, you, you can't have a cap on your head. But we forget verse 3. Notice again verse 3. Christ is the head of every man. That's the code. That's the key, the interpretive key. Now, if Christ is the head of every man, every man who has something on his head or over his head while praying or prophesying disgraces his head. Now, the scripture has already told us in verse 3, your head is not the thing sitting on your shoulders. But the key here is Christ is the head of every man. Look at verse 4 again. Every man who has something on or over uh, uh, his head, that is Christ. If you've got something on Christ, while you're coming trying to do your spiritual work of praying and prophesying, you disgrace your head, who is Christ. It's not talking about this thing right here. It's talking about Christ. Then verse 5 comes along. Every woman who has her head uncovered, what is her head? The man is the head of the woman. Every woman who has the man who's the head of her uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces that man. That is, she is not under the authority of a husband who is under Christ. And uh, it speaks about this. Now, as, uh, as we carry that along then, I want you to... Uh, uh, to get back uh, to, we come then to, uh, to, to verse 3. And here in verse 3 it says, If the woman be not covered. Now I have switched to King James here. And let me just say a, a quick word about King James. I don't typically use King James in the pulpit. It's hard for people to understand, hard for people to read. But let me say, in terms of a faithful translation, word for word, that holds to verbal plenary inspiration, the King James is the best hands down. So, uh, use, have one and use it for studying especially. And uh, it says, if the woman be not covered, let her be shorn. For if she be, uh, but if, if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. That is very close to what the Greek says. Notice New American Standard doesn't even go there. It says, if a woman does not cover her head. Now, compare that. So New American, to, to King James, if a woman be not covered. New American Standard added her head, which gives us a different thought. So if a woman be not covered, uh, let her, later let her be covered. That gets at the message. And the message is, hey, ladies need to be under the authority of a man who's under the authority of Christ. This is a, a chain of command that's given here. Now, We've changed the New American Standard in English Standard. Uh, the English Standard goes for a wife. Now, uh, I think woman is a better translation here, but it is the same Greek word, and so you have to use context here. Uh, but so uh, we, we, we've added to it. Be not covered to don't cover your head. Gives you a different idea. Uh, New International Version says the same. If a woman does not cover her head. Uh, Good News Bible. If a woman does not cover her head, she should cover her head. Now, those are all fairly close. Look what the message says. Worse, she dishonors herself, an ugly sight, like a woman with her head shaved. This is basically the origin of these customs we have of women wearing head coverings in worship while men take their hats off. Now, I want to say to the authors of the message, where did you come up with that? That's not even close in the Greek. It's not even, in fact, I don't even think that 1 Corinthians chapter 11 has anything to do with a fellow having a cap on in his worship service or a woman putting on a prayer shawl. It's not even about that. It's because you don't take verbal plenary inspiration that you have made it that. And so here they have just totally inserted an idea. It's commentary. It's a footnote. It does not belong in the Bible. Basically, they say this is the origin of where we got this thing about women cover their heads and men take their hats off. Now, now, let me tell you how ridiculous that is. The Corinthians came from a Jewish background. If you've traveled to Israel at all, you know that uh, 
that when you go into a Jewish synagogue, what does a man do? He covers his head. He puts a cap on it. What the message has said is totally foreign to anything in the Jewish context. In other words, it just totally messed it up. Now, let's uh, look at verse 10. Uh, King James, again, says, For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Now, power on her head. Really, the, the, I, I think the best word there would really be authority. For this cause, the woman ought to have authority on her head. That is, she ought to have a, a man who's under the authority of Christ. And, uh, and, and we won't get into an aspect about the angels. We'll have to do that at another time. So New American Standard says, this woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head. Now, the word symbol is not there. And uh, the, the authors, uh, the, Paul, as uh, God gave him the words, he had the opportunity to use head covering or cap, uh, ball cap or shawl. I mean, those words are in Greek. He didn't use them, though. And the word symbol is not there. Add it into. That's a dangerous thing for verbal plenary inspiration because a lot hangs on a word. So uh, English Standard Version does the same thing, and uh, a New International Version basically does the same thing, a sign of authority. Instead of just power or authority, they've added a symbol or a sign. Uh, Good News Bible, a woman should have a covering on her head to show that he's under her husband's authority. Now, uh, here they just, they just make it. Woman, cover up your head. And you know that's caused so much confusion in the church, and some of you ladies maybe are saying, well, do I need to have my head covered when I go into worship because I want to be obedient to the Scripture? And if you read the Good News Bible, then you need to have your head covered. It says right there, a woman should have uh, covering over her head. But that's not what the words say in verbal plenary inspiration. It says you ought to be there under the authority of your husband who's under the authority of God. This is the ideal circumstances that God has created. Now, the message, which says, don't, by the way, read too much into the differences here between men and women. You know what? I, I, that verse right there, if I didn't do it already, that's enough for me to say, close the message and never use it again except to, 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 to make fun of people who, uh, who, who, who just have totally slaughtered the word. Compare those two verses. They're nowhere... There is no comparison. It's a different book. The message is not the Bible. Don't use it. So don't, don't read too much into the differences here between men and women. I, I, I hope you see that uh, they obviously don't believe in verbal plenary inspiration at all. Now, here's uh, verses uh, 10, and, 10, 11, and 12. Uh, the, some of these verses that we have uh, been looking at, all in the message. And I want to point out just a couple of things. Don't, by the way, read too much into the differences here between men and women. Now, that is simply egalitarian. Well, what does that mean? Egalitarian is the idea that women and men all have the same role. Now, the opposite of egalitarian is complementarian that men and women complement one another, and that God has made them to complement one another. The writers of the message had a, a theological bent that they wanted to get across, and so they just inserted it here. And egalitarianism is what they inserted. Don't read too much into the differences here between men and women. If you were to read the Greek, if you were to read the actual words, you would never get that out of that message. Now, going on. But the head of the woman's body clearly outshines in beauty the the head of her head, her husband. Uh, That sentence really is simply heretical. Consider it, if you know the key and use the words. But the head on a woman's body. Now, according to verse 3, the head on a woman's body is what? It's her husband. And here they say, the head on a woman's body clearly outshines in beauty the head of her head, her husband. That's a confusing sentence, but I think, I think it's trying to say women are prettier than men. I don't have a problem with that. But what this says is heretical. Why? Because a woman's head outshines the head of her husband. The head of her husband is Christ. This, basically, that, that phrase right there, if you take the key in verse 3, says 
a woman is, is, uh, is, is more glorious than Jesus Christ himself. It's really what that verse says when you read it through there. Simply heretical. And uh, then uh, simply dismissal. That is, it dismisses the whole thing at the bottom when it says, and since virtually everything comes from God anyway, let's quit going through these who's first routines. <laughs> Basically, the, author, the authors of the message came to verse 12 and said, this is a foolish discussion anyway. We shouldn't even have this in the Bible. Let's just forget about this and move on. Now, I hope uh, I've convinced you that the message is not the translation you need to be using if you're one who holds a verbal plenary inspiration. Now, if you hold the verbal plenary inspiration, uh, how does this affect our teaching? If you haven't figured it out already, uh, when uh, I uh, share this, uh, I, I used to have opportunity. I don't anymore because of some uh, the way we schedule our services. But when I share this in uh, with uh, new or people who are planning to come into the church, I want them to know that this, this is going to affect the way I teach a scripture. And so you're going to hear some things that you hadn't heard before, like Luke chapter 13 having to do with the destruction of Jerusalem by Rome in A.D. 70. You hadn't heard that before, and you look at that and you say, where in the world did he come up with that? It does affect our teaching. Here's how. First of all, when you believe, you and I, when we believe in verbal plenary inspiration, then we take each passage seriously. That is, uh, we, we, we don't just skip over yeah, yeah, you've seen in the church world today, haven't you, how, how uh, you know, they just never got to the book of Leviticus in their teaching or the book of Numbers or some of those little minor, uh, minor prophets in the back or they get to some of these difficult passages when they're teaching through, through 1 Corinthians and they just skip that part in chapter 11 because, after all, we don't wear hats in church anymore and that's, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, just not, not culturally relevant, relevant, so we skip that. Not if you believe in verbal plenary inspiration. You say, I've got to take it seriously. Not only that, but we take each word for its real meaning. Words like likewise mean likewise. And we're forced to have an interpretation that fits the use of that word. So it affects our teaching just tremendously, greatly. Then we search for the doctrinal significance of each word, of each phrase, of each verse. I mentioned to you uh, previously in Luke chapter 13 how when it says that it was on this same occasion. Uh, now, we'll, we'll take that and we'll say, okay, then this occasion then must matter in order to interpret this correctly. And uh, so we begin to look at this. We begin to put it together and I, uh, I think there are so many times in the passages of Scripture where we have to take some words and we have to use them, and uh, we have to use them uh, just uh, very, very seriously. And uh, as uh, I was just thinking here of Numbers chapter 33, verse 2, uh, where Moses is recording the journey that the children of Israel have taken, and it says Moses recorded their starting places and their, their journeys by the command of the Lord. And these are the journeys according to their starting places, and it begins to go on, and it just begins to give the, the journeys. Now, when you believe in verbal plenary inspiration, and you run across that, and says, Moses wrote these down by the command of the Lord. Then you say, you know what? There's some doctrinal significance here. I'm going to search every word, every phrase, every verse. I am going to find the meaning in the passage. Now, you're out there in a church, or you're reading a Bible, or you're, uh, 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 excuse me, a, a book from the, uh, from the Christian bookstore, you're reading it, uh, or you are listening to the radio and you're hearing a preacher. What are some warning signs that they don't believe in verbal plenary inspiration? And uh, you, you may, by the way, need to go and do some work like uh, Priscilla and Aquila, who taught Apollos a more excellent way. So what are some warning signs? Here, here's the first one. A regular use of a dynamic equivalent version or a paraphrase of the Bible. That is, in the pulpit, they use the, uh, the, the, the message or the living translation or uh, today's English version or even the New International Version, which is uh, one, of the, one of the more conservative dynamic equivalents, but it's still a dynamic equivalent. That is, it, it carries forth ideas, not words. The regular use of that is a little red flag, a warning sign. 
Here's another one. If they have a disdain or a marginalization of the use of Hebrew and Greek. You see, I have uh, come to believe that in order to understand these words, we've really got to dig down and find out what is the word that was translated. Some translator had to make a decision on that word. So I want to dig into the Hebrew. I want to dig into the Greek and figure that out. Now, not everyone can do that. I understand. There are tools that are making that easier. But there are so many pastors, teachers, preachers out there today who, uh, who, who really make fun of those who use Hebrew or those who use Greek and and they have a dissent. Oh, we don't do that around here. We just want to love God and love others. And, and they, they marginalize that kind of scholarly work. That's a warning sign saying, oh, they don't think the words are really that important. Here's another warning sign, and that is uh, sermons or lessons or books uh, that, that are about a particular passage of Scripture, but they don't teach what that Scripture actually says. We see that in in box interpretation of Luke chapter 13. And as you begin to look at it, uh, and maybe you go to a sermon and, and they say, you know, tonight we're, we're going to, this sermon, we're going to talk about, uh, uh, you know, pick, pick, we're going to talk about David. And uh, we're going to talk about what David did here and there. And, and uh, yet what you find out is before the sermon's over, they really talked about you. They talked about me. They talked about life. They talked about 2013 and all the things that are going about us now. And you walk away. If you, if you walk away and say, you know, what, did I, what do I know about David that I didn't know before then? And if you say, I, nothing. Or what do I know about, uh, uh, about Jehu or Abihu or some of the Baal or whatever the, the case may be? What do I know about Psalm 2 or Psalm 18 that I didn't know before I went in? If they're not teaching what that passage of Scripture says, on a regular basis, and you're not walking out saying, I learned something about that passage or about that person, then they probably don't believe in verbal plenary inspiration. Here's a, another warning sign. is a failure to teach systematically through the Word of God. That is, if a preacher believes in verbal plenary inspiration, you know what he's going to do? He's going to take a book or a section of Scripture, and he's going to say, we're going to work through this because the words matter. And he's not going to take a, a book like, uh, like the book of Ephesians and say it's got uh, six chapters. We'll cover this in six weeks. No, I was going to say, there's way too much here. So it's a warning sign. If your pastor, teacher, book, radio, radio uh, preacher, television preacher, whoever it is, doesn't teach systematically through the Word of God. I'm not saying they should always have an exegetical sermon. There, are, there is an occasion for a topical sermon, but... If, if that's their diet and they never teach verse by verse by verse by verse, then they probably don't believe in verbal plenary inspiration. And then a great warning sign is if they have an inability to carry on a biblical conversation about doctrine. You know, here's, uh, here's my experience. Uh, in fact, I was uh, visiting just last night with uh, a, a good friend of mine who's president of a seminary, actually, and asking him some theological questions and inter interacting with him. And I said, you know, I, I appreciate your time because if I needed someone, another pastor that I could talk uh, golf or church growth principles or stock market, there are a dime a dozen. I can find them out there. But to find a pastor who can carry on a doctrinal conversation, why is that so rare? It's a sad thing, isn't it? And, and the reason it's so rare is they just don't believe in verbal plenary inspiration. So you'll ask them a question about a doctrine, and their answer will be, you know what, we don't worry about that around here. Uh, that's a secondary matter. I just want to love you and care for you, and I want us all to get along. And uh, take that as a warning sign. Verbal plenary inspiration. Last week we saw that God has spoken in his word, 66 books of the Bible. His word is all that's needed for us to be complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work. And then secondly, tonight so we've learned that God was, uh, God's word was given verbally. Each one of the words is God breathed. Now in just a moment I'm going to take uh, some of your questions. You can go ahead and uh, type them in if you uh, want to. Uh, and uh, if you have some, but uh, as I do that, uh, today on the website, just posted a new article that explains Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18, about the glory of God's inheritance. 
and it's uh, available right on the website, randywhiteministries.org. You might want to go and read that. Uh, if you didn't get it in email today, then sign up for our emails while you're there at the uh, website also. And I uh, hope you'll go like us on Facebook. That helps us out, helps spread the word. Uh, and you can go to facebook.com slash randywhiteministries. And uh, then, as I've already mentioned, go to the website, randywhiteministries.org. Find the stuff that's there. Listen to the uh, latest broadcast. And get the app. Uh, you can get the app by searching Dr. White in your app store, uh, Google or, or iTunes or uh, whatever format you use. It's coming soon on, uh, uh, on the iPad. And uh, just search Dr. White. Get that. It's free. And uh, you can listen. Let me say also, we love our Club Club 8 members. I appreciate those of you who are members of Club 8 or Club 360. And uh, that's just uh, people who give a simple $8 a month. It helps us pay the bills. And uh, I just appreciate that so much. You can find out about that on the website. Now, uh, we are going to take a few uh, questions here. And if you have typed in your questions, I'll turn the uh, mics on as well. Uh, in uh, just a moment and uh, see what uh, we have. And um, uh, here's a question from Tom, 1 Corinthians 11, 3 through 10. Can you uh, summarize uh, what you teach that it meant to the original audience? That's a, that's a great question, Tom, uh, because um, the, uh, the, the, the one who believes in verbal plenary inspiration is going to ask that question. What did the original audience hear? And the audience in Corinth, as you begin to put that book together and see the uh, context there, they had some issues in their church. And some of those issues had to do with the role of men and women and the authority there within the church. And so I think that what they were hearing is that uh, there is a, a, a different role for men than for women and in leadership within the uh, body of Christ and, and, and spiritual leadership that the women were to come under the authority of their husband who was under the authority of Christ. Um, and uh, so I, I appreciate that question there. Tom, I had a question about uh, these notes available after the meeting. And, um, yeah, I can understand that you can't uh, keep up with all that. Uh, yes, they, they are, or at least they will be. Let me say uh, two things about that. First of all, the... Uh, there's a recording of this that will go up. Uh, it usually takes about a couple of hours before the recording goes. Uh, of course, to listen to that, you've got to go through the hour again and listen to it. And uh, you can do that. That's on our website, randywhiteministries.com slash online. Uh, on that same uh, page, we will add the downloadable version or the online version of this actual PowerPoint that does not have the recording. Thank you, Nancy. And we'll add uh, that uh, to you. We've got a visitor here from New York City. God bless you, Jonathan. Uh, appreciate it here. That makes us uh, coast to coast because I think we've got some California in here also. You are now unmuted. Now, I am going to uh, unmute the uh, participants. So if you're on the phone line, you can ask a question now. And I would remind you that uh, it's being recorded, so if you ask anything, uh, you're going to be on YouTube forever and a day. And uh, so, any more questions, either through uh, typing them in or um, to uh, speak them? There is a, uh, a question here. What, uh, translations, uh, what, what translations do you recommend? You, you know, I tell you, I use the New American Standard, and I got into that a long time ago. Uh, somewhat by accident because I didn't know all this stuff then. And now as a pastor, a lot of people uh, have bought New American Standards because I use one. So if I switch translations, then the bookstore appreciates that uh, because they're going to sell a lot of new Bibles. But a lot of uh, people who own one are not going to do so. I, but I tell you, if I were starting in ministry today knowing what I knew, know, I think I would go with a New King James. Uh, it has the the, uh, the 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 clarity of a modern translation, and yet it holds to the uh, verbal plenary inspiration. So, New American Standard, I think, would be the second best. Uh, New King James, King James, if you can follow along, but again, some of the language has uh, has become archaic and is rather uh, difficult for us. So, thank you for that question, David and Jan. Anyone else got a question tonight, either verbally or uh, online? Uh, 
Okay, thank you, Beth. Uh, once I understand what the passage meant for that audience, how do I bring meaning to my life for today? Uh, this is uh, an issue that people in our society are very much uh, dealing with because I think in the church today we have fallen in love with uh, application. We want everything to have some specific meaning for us today. And it doesn't all directly. Let's take the Luke 13 passage, for example. As I read through that and I realize, okay, uh, Jesus was warning the city of Jerusalem and especially the religious leaders that they needed to repent, accept him as the king, as the Messiah. Otherwise, there was going to be a great punishment and the, uh, the, the nation was going to be destroyed and they were going to die. Now, what direct application does that have for me? I don't live in Jerusalem, and I've received Christ as my Savior, and the Romans have already destroyed Jerusalem a long time ago. So you could say it doesn't have application, but you'd be wrong. See, I think the application then comes to say, are there some things that God warns me about? And you can even get to where most translators want to go with this and, and say, well, yeah, there's a repentance I need to do as well. And that you can find the way in which basically what Luke 13 does is solidify your, uh, your, your, your application and uh, is, is used as an illustration of your application. So sometimes there's not a direct application, but you can use that as an illustration of that which applies in other passages of Scripture. I think as we go through more of these doctrinal distinctives, you will uh, see some of that uh, taking place. Uh, I got a question here about, uh, from Cheryl about the English standard. And, uh, you know, English Standard Version is a word-for-word uh, a -word -word translation. There are just a couple of areas, and I'm, I'm not an expert on the English Standard uh, Version, although it has become very popular, but I have looked at a couple of areas in which I was not comfortable with the word that they used to uh, translate. And uh, one of those areas, uh, I believe that uh, I can... Uh, put up for us here on the screen uh, and uh, just show you an example here. Let me get the uh, Bible software showing for you. And uh, there we go. Uh, in Ephesians uh, chapter 1, and I believe the verse is um, verse 10. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10 with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of times. Now, uh, I want you to remember that word, the administration suitable to the fullness of times. First of all, let's go to the King James Version and look at verse, verse 10, where it says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times. Now, uh, dispensation is... It's really the best word. It's the, it's the economy. I wish we could get into it long more and we would sometime. But uh, a dispensation or an administration. Administration is okay there. Uh, but if we go to the English Standard Version and look at it, it says a plan for the fullness of times. Now, a dispensation or an administration or literally house rules is not the same as a plan. And I think that there was some theological reasons that the writers or the translators of the Even Though Standard Version did not want to say dispensation or administration or economy because the uh, editorial board of the English Standard Version are not dispensationalists. So they used a different word there, and I think it's an accurate word. So that's the, that's the one area I can tell you about the English Standard Version that I'm uncomfortable with. Uh, I think it tries to be faithful by and large, but it is, uh, I think, sufficient there in uh, that particular area. Okay, uh, I, I am going to stop the recording here, but and uh, we'll conclude the Bible study. But if there are any of you who want to remain and uh, add in a few questions or uh, continue the business, then we will uh, go ahead and do that. But uh, in terms of the recording, we're going to stop at this time. So I thank each one of you for joining us. Those who stay on, uh, we'll chat here for uh, the next little bit. Make sure we get all your questions uh, answered. So. God bless you. We're going to be back next week, and uh, we have worked it out where you're not going to have to uh, sign up uh, each uh, each meeting, and I'll send out information, but you go to randywhiteministries.org, 